Now, I'm delighted to say I am joined by P-Mount uh, striker Stephanie Roach. Uh, she's going to join me here to talk about her League of Ireland life story. Uh, I know she doesn't play in the League of Ireland as such, but uh, a very famous Irish women's footballer from years gone by and still very prominent in the uh, the Women's National League. Stephanie, how are you doing today? I'm good, thank you, Kieran. How are you? Yeah, so I suppose, Stephanie, um, it, it's gone full circle for yourself, really. Uh, P-Mount, really, where you broke onto the scene in the Women's National League. You're back there now after a couple of spells abroad. Uh, how have you found returning to the, the domestic game here? Yeah, it's been good. It's been nice just to be home. Um, as you say, I've been away for probably eight, seven, eight years. Um, so been out of the league for a while. The league has kind of seen a lot of players come and go over the last couple of years. But yeah, I'm just happy to be back home near family and friends and, and obviously playing football with, with P-Mount again. Do you feel overall the league has developed in the years you've been away? Um, I have to approach this diplomatically, don't I? <laughs> um, I think it has in certain ways. Definitely the publicity around the league has, has changed. I think a lot of people are taking more notice of the league. And I think in terms of the media coverage the league is getting, you hear about it more, you hear our results on the radio and stuff, which you never would have heard before. Um, but I do think there's still a lot of improvements needed to be made. Um, I think keeping our best players here I think it's always been a thing to to go and play professional and be away and I think the goal should be to try and make the league here semi-pro at least and mm. um, with the obviously future goal to try and go professional because we've seen other other countries do it that are at a similar level to us in terms of Scotland a lot of their teams have gone semi-pro and you've seen how good they've they've done really well in the Champions League so so why can't we do it so I think Overall, I think there's been a bit of an improvement in terms of people are definitely taking notice of the league a little bit more, but I think there's, there's still a long way to go. Is the, the situation we're in going to make that more difficult going forward? Obviously, there's going to be reduced finances across Irish football, across football in general, across the world. So is that goal maybe pushed back a couple of years now with that in mind? I think, I think, unfortunately, I've seen even in, in England and in, in abroad, abroad in kind of clubs and women's teams who are involved. I played at Sunderland uh, when Sunderland were relegated twice. Um, so I've seen the effects that that can have on the women's game in terms of, unfortunately, the women's team isn't the priority. The men are the team who bring in the money and who are, unfortunately, at times seen as as the as the, the better team. And, and that can definitely have an effect on, on the women's side of things. But I do think that... My, as I said, it has improved over the last couple of years. And I do think that a lot of people seem to care a bit more about it. I think the 2020 uh, campaign has helped that. It's helped, I think, get people to notice the game a little bit more, not just women's football, but women's sports in general. So I think hopefully it doesn't have too much of an effect, but I can see it having a little bit, but hopefully we can push past that as soon as hopefully things get back to a little bit of normality. Yeah, and of course, on the international scene, it was a big year 2020 for the Irish women's team. And they were so unlucky not to at least get a playoff for the, the European Championship finals. Uh, is that a sign that women's football is coming forward in this country? It mightn't be as quick as we'd like, but we're definitely seeing some progression there. Yeah, I do think that this... I had a conversation actually on air with uh, P, uh, Peter Collins at the time of the Germany game. It was frustration because I think the, the Germany game obviously wasn't the issue. It was the games beforehand where we yeah. let people away. And I know the girls were obviously very disappointed with that. But for me, it, like I've been involved in the Irish team for... 12 years maybe the last two years I haven't been as as involved as I would have liked to have been but I've kind of heard people talk about women's football and the international team getting somewhere in those 12 years and it hasn't happened yet so for me I think it's it needs to be more than just words and, and people saying oh we're getting there there has to be more done I think it's definitely changed in terms of as I said before it's the same as the women's national league there's more media coverage more people know about when the women's national team are playing the games are live and or to eat, there's, there's more of a hype around the games, but I still think there's stuff that needs to be done behind the scenes. And it can't just be, as I said, lip service in terms of people saying that it's getting better when really we have never, we've never qualified for a major mm. tournament. So I think focus really needs to turn on, on making that change and, and getting players or getting the team there. Because as I said, I've been around for a long time and I've been hearing the same thing after every campaign and it can become tiresome. I know it's new to people that are only kind of starting to notice women's football now or maybe starting to watch it, but... As I said, for people like myself and others who have been around for a long time, it's it seems to be that after every campaign, we're almost there and just we're not quite making it. You touched on it yourself there. You haven't been as involved in the international scene as years gone by. And you mentioned already your spell in Sunderland. You had a horrific injury there during your time. Has it been hard to come back to the level you feel you were at previously? And how do you feel you're, you're getting on in that challenge at the moment? Yeah, that was a bit of a strange one for me, actually. I think when it happened first, there was obviously a bit of a fear that maybe I'd done my ACL, which was 
for any footballer is the big no, no, no one wants to do that. And I was quite lucky. Well, I felt lucky at the time that I hadn't done that. And I've been told that I just had a depressed uh, fracture and that I'd only be out for six to eight weeks. And I was like, OK, at the time, we that was our first game of the qualifiers. And we had a big game against the Netherlands coming up in the, in the November. So I was hoping to get back for that. And unfortunately, it came to Christmas and I still wasn't right. And I ended up being told I could go back to play and I was good to go. And I went back to Sunderland because I had been doing my rehab in Ireland because it happened with the Irish team. So I went back to, to Sunderland and I was training and running and I had a lot of pain in my knee and just above my knee. And I just thought it was just being usual coming back from from injury, having been out for a long time. I was thinking it was probably in my head. I'm, I'm OK. And I went to train one of the days and we were playing just a little five-a-side thing. And I kind of joined in a little bit more than I had been doing. And I remember I struck through the ball and the pain that I got up my leg was just unbelievable. I couldn't believe the pain. I just had to stop and I kind of just stood there for a minute and kind of tried to jog it off and and kept going, but just tried not to hit the ball the same way I had. And it turned out that actually I had to go home and have another x-ray and I had a stress fracture to just the tip of my femur, which hadn't been noticed. So I ended up being out then for for nearly the course of two years, 18 months anyway. And it was unfortunate because I think that I really was starting to to come into my own at Sunderland I was starting to to play in I suppose I was playing in a different position when I went to Sunderland I played left wing back and I kind of I was getting used to playing that position and playing the way Sunderland wanted me to play and it just unfortunately that injury came at a really bad time for me and it came at the start of a, a really good campaign with Colin Bell who who I really admired as a manager as well so it was just a yeah unfortunate injury to get at, at, a, at an unfortunate time and I was out of contract the year after I got it. So I kind of was still injured when I was out of contract at a club. So that's difficult for any player to try and find your feet again. Where do I go? Do I stay at home? Do I go abroad? And yeah, it was just a bit of a crazy time. Yeah, well, you've had well over 50 caps. So we'd love to see you back in the green jersey uh, more regularly going forward. But uh, look, in terms of a club career, you, you've you've been all over. And it, it's great to see Irish female players now starting to go elsewhere because a little bit like the League of Ireland as well. It was always the UK was always the goal just to get players to the UK. But we're seeing more Irish players go elsewhere now as well. You've been to France, you've been uh, to Italy and you've been to America as well. Tell us about that as an experience. They've all been obviously fantastic experiences, life experiences as much as football experiences. And I think I've learned and experienced different things completely in every country that I've been in. So it's it's something that obviously the older I get now and the more I look back on it, I have to be proud of. I think going to America was was something that I could never turn down the opportunity to go and play in in the NWSL was huge and and I actually really enjoyed it. Strangely, the way it worked out, it didn't it didn't actually obviously work out the way I would have in the end, but I enjoyed the players that I met, the people that I worked with, and the manager really liked me. It was just an unfortunate situation that had happened that two of two or three of the players, in two definitely done ACL injuries, two defenders, and another girl then got injured as well. And and with the international uh, rule, you can only have three international players. And in fairness, they had looked at, at American players or players who are living close to Houston to try and get them into the squad, but they couldn't get anyone to fit what they needed so they ended up having to get rid of one international player to bring in an international defender and look it was unfortunate but I enjoyed my time there I think overall looking back on my career abroad I think Sunderland was probably my most successful and most enjoyable time and and I made some great friends and met some good people and and had some very good football moments over there as well so I think as I said I've learned quite a lot off the field as much as I have on the field but I just look back and I suppose think of all the good things that happened and it was was a pretty decent career. Yeah, the Italian experience is one I really want to ask you about because I remember seeing a couple of pictures you threw up on your social media. I think you were playing against Juventus and uh, the ultras were out in force, the, the the flares, the smoke bombs, they had all the, the banners and the flags. It looked like a, an amazing experience. What What's that like uh, to, to play in front of? Yeah, the, flan- the fans of Florencia, to be fair, it's just especially when we, we moved in the first year, we were uh, playing just outside Florence and the second year we moved to San Gimignano and the fans were just absolutely on the like, It was great for us, but it was crazy for people coming to watch us play. But yeah, it was just a different experience. Again, as I said, total different style of football, the way they want to play. The fans were just absolutely amazing. Like, they just really like, give us that kind of push in games, especially against the big teams. We got some very good results against the big teams. We we beat AC Milan at home. I think we drew with Roma. We had like we had some really, really good results against, as I said, the big teams. But yeah, the fans were, were just kind of really fanatical. And it was it seemed to be that their weekend was just based on going with the football matches and supporting teams. And it was it was really nice to see. 
Brilliant stuff. Uh, as I said a little while earlier, it's come full circle, really. You burst onto the scene in the in the Women's League here with P-Mount. You've come back this year. You won the Cup. You got a couple of uh, goals in the Cup final. As good as ever. Yeah, look, it's, this season, in fairness, has probably been a bit crazy for me. I think going back from Italy, I oh, the training regime in Italy was a lot different to what I've ever been used to. I remember... I actually got a stress fracture in my ankle that I kind of didn't know I had and I kept on playing and then I ended up rolling my ankle and just played through it. So I had a couple of kind of knocks over there towards the end of my time there. And when I came back, I couldn't seem to shake the little niggles that I was getting just from the injuries that I had picked up over there. So I kind of needed time throughout the season and I had a couple of stupid little knocks again for, for Pima, which is frustrating because when you're going back from injury, you don't want to keep talking about injuries and and getting them particularly. So I think towards the end of the season to finish on a high like that for myself personally and obviously for the club to get the double was, was pretty special. And it kind of just made me think that I think in my head mentally, I still have it, you know. I think there's times where when you get little injuries and things like that are happening, you can definitely get down on yourself and you can think, Jesus, maybe I am. Maybe I should just pack it in. Maybe it's not working out, you know, like on the way. But towards the end of the season, the players and the management staff at PMAT really made me feel like, I had a big role to play at the club and I think that's mentally really, really important for any player to feel that you have something to give and I think, as I said, that game gave me that little boost and I really can't wait to get going this season again now and just really, as I said, show that I, I still have something to offer and that I can be a really good player within the league. Yeah, I think it's definitely clear you've still got plenty to offer on the pitch but off the pitch, um, you've launched your own academy. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, look, obviously, like most businesses, COVID has really affected it this year. We started two years ago in February, I think it is. And basically what it is, is we kind of have a long-term goal to actually set up our own academy to try and help young players, boys and girls, get away and get to to maybe National League teams or maybe to, to abroad, to England and, and further. So that was kind of the, the really long-term goal for me personally, was to try and set that up. But in the meantime, we've started uh, camps. We're in schools. We've been doing... Um, school sessions after schools, in school, PE sessions, stuff like that. And it's really starting to take off. We had three schools going in the local area. We were about to get into another two schools and then obviously all this has happened. So it's kind of being put on hold, um, which is unfortunate. But hopefully, as I said before, with, with everything that is as soon as COVID stops or goes away or whatever happens, when things can get back to a bit of normality, we might be able to to sort that again. But yeah, it's something I'm really passionate about. I love coaching kids. I love doing one-to-one sessions. I love doing team sessions and and just kind of seeing, we had a, 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 a young girl on one of our first camps in uh, in Joey's in Sally Logan, and she played for Temple Oak United. And I remember just just kid like messing around with her, showing her a rainbow flick, and like she was tiny, couldn't get the ball up anywhere near over her head. And just there last year, she sent me, um, would have been probably in October, November, sent me a video of her completing the rainbow flick and Brilliant. and kicking it. Like also, which was really nice to see that that she still is practicing the skill that I taught really. We were just messing around, you know, that kind of way. So it was nice to see that, as I said, a player like that is is developing the way she is. And, and it's the same for anybody else who comes to our camps and, and comes to our sessions because that's something that I'm, I'm really, I suppose, trying to push with our coaches whenever we're on the camps. That it's not just coming and kicking the ball around, sitting down, mm. we don't want to play. We try to keep them involved and make sure they play and learn something going home. And, and that's kind of being why our camps have been as successful as they have been. So hopefully, as I said, as soon as COVID is over, we'll be able to to get going again and, and get back to where we were. Yeah, that's that's a brilliant little story about the rainbow flick. That's what it's all about. Um, if people are interested in, in looking up a bit more information on that, where can they find you on, on social media? Yeah, it's just, it's Stephanie Roach Football Coaching. So it's Stephanie Roach FC on all uh, social media platforms. We're on Facebook and Instagram mainly, and we have got a Twitter page as well. So Brilliant stuff. Um, linking in what we were discussing earlier, how women's football has come on. Um, I was reading before that when you were younger, you actually had to move clubs because one of the clubs you were at wouldn't allow, um, I think, you to play against against boys. So you had to move to an all girls team. So the fact now that we've got academies like yours starting to launch, and is there more opportunities for girls out there now? Young yeah, girls. Yeah. I think for me, when I first started playing, I didn't even know about girls teams. I used to play football in the streets with the lads. I was bit of a tomboy growing up I suppose um, I had my group of girlfriends who I'd done the usual regular stuff with and then as soon as the lads came out with a ball I was gone you know so it was kind of that's where I learned how to play football I played in the streets in Shankill and I only kind of knew really about teams because some of the lads had joined the local team in Shankill and it was only when one of their mams came to me and said would you not go and play with the team that I realised I could actually play in a boys team because I didn't know there were girls teams there, there weren't many at the time 
So yeah, it went from there. And then I think the age at the time was 13. They had to stop playing with the boys. I think it's I think it's definitely gone up. I think it may be 15 or 16 now, but that was the rule at the time that, that girls couldn't play in the boys' team. So I didn't really know anything about girls' teams. And it was only that we played the local park in Shankill, our home matches. And there was a man, Mick Caulfield, who lived in Shankill who managed the girls' team in Gavin Seeley. So he obviously came up to my dad after one of the matches and just said, look, I know Steph's not able to play with the boys after next season. Would you be interested in coming to Gavin Seeley? And, and playing with us it just took off from there so I think for me personally growing up I didn't know a lot about women's football and I think as I said before that's definitely changing I think there's a huge uh, emphasis on on highlighting uh, female athletes which is great to see and I think that gives young girls a goal and a dream to be able to say like because before when I was growing up my heroes were Van Nistelrooy like male players never kind of I never really knew much about women's footballers apart from maybe Olivia O'Toole who played in the Irish women's team so I think it's huge for young girls to be able to have that to look up to and as I said the more uh, publicised the game is the better it is for, for future generations which hopefully will continue. Yeah, look, obviously there does have to be a certain cutoff point for, for where we can have mixed gender teams. Um, but would you agree that at a young age, maybe it's not always a bad thing for girls to play against the boys? Because I know my younger sister, um, she played when she played in Longford uh, back a couple of years ago, there was no girls team. So they were always playing against boys teams. And while they took a couple of hammerings along the way, when she did eventually get into girls teams, then you could see she had learned so much in her game from from playing against boys. Uh, definitely, it's it's definitely stood to me. I think I I played uh, on the streets so I was probably eighteen or nineteen with the lads, so it definitely stood to me. And I think it makes you tougher. It makes you, especially when you play with your like. I grew up playing with lads, as I said, and they kind of they treated me as one of the lads. So it wasn't a case of oh, geez, don't tackle Steph. She's a girl. It was they were getting stuck into me as much as they were anybody else, you know. So that definitely helped my my physical side of the game and physicality because I've always been kind of slight and I wouldn't have been that type of player. So it definitely made me become a little bit stronger on the ball and, and, and stronger in tackles. And obviously, look, I don't like comparing male, men and women's football because I do think it's a totally different game. I think there's there's a lot of different attributes within the game, but playing against boys, boys are faster, they're stronger. So obviously naturally you have to move the ball quicker. You have to move yourself quicker. You can't hold onto the ball too long. I think that can only be good for, for players' development. And and even now I'm, I'm 31 and I still go and train with the, the 17s and Bray or the 19s and Bray sometimes. So like that helps me in terms of them obviously being physically stronger than me and quicker than me. It, it makes me, as I said, do things a little bit quicker and it's always it's always going to help you. I think a young player to, to be playing kind of at the, the, the highest level you can for as long as you can. And uh, away from the coaching side of things as well, you've been very, very busy um, as a pundit of late. Um, Premier Sports is where I suppose you're most notable at the moment. Are, are you enjoying that side of things at the moment? Yeah, okay, I really enjoy it. I think it's, we're still in the early stages of people getting used to seeing female pundits talking about the male game, which I think is is obviously for me a difficult one when you hear people talking on social media and stuff <laughs> like that. But I think it's 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 slowly changing. Um, for me personally, I love the, the game I'm obviously a big Man United fan I, I've done a Man United game over Christmas and it was difficult to try and be uh, to not uh, had to bite my tongue a few times about yeah. giving it about United and stuff but yeah look I, I really enjoy that side of the game I think any player who I've ever played with will tell you that I'd always be quite uh, analytic after a game I'd always look back at things and talk about what we could have done better and I love if I, if I am watching a match on TV I love watching Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher dissect games at half time and stuff like that so it is something that, that I really do enjoy and, and obviously to be able to give that to be given that opportunity to work as I said to you before we even came on here in the Premier League which is a, a league that I watch quite a lot is is really nice and I feel I feel quite lucky to be have been given that opportunity Yeah as you said we are starting to see more women pundits and some really good ones as well um, but there has been a couple of female pundits they've taken awful abuse on social media is that something you've come across in your short time on television? Yeah look I think the more most recently with Karen Carney is it was just a little bit silly. I think leads yeah. re- and like it's just no need for it. I think look, at, I'm not saying that female pundits aren't shouldn't be open to criticism because I personally would give some male uh, pundits and commentaries when you say things that are stupid. I'd say yeah. things on Twitter. So I'm not saying that we should be completely not said at like if we say something that not people don't agree with. That's what football is all about. It's a game of opinions. People are always going to have a different opinion to to whether it be Roy Key and Jamie Radnap. I don't know, Alex Scott, Karen Kearney, they're always going to have a different opinion to it. But I mean, I feel like for women, it's a case of if they don't say something stupid that you can slate them on, you're going to slate about what they're wearing, how they look, they're wearing too makeup, too much makeup, they're not wearing enough makeup. There's always something that I feel that like there's always going to be someone to pick on. I think, as I said, the majority of people now understand that 
were not back in the 1920s. Like women watch football, they've played football at a high level, they know the game and, and they have as much knowledge as, as, as some uh, pundits. So I think it's just a case of, as I said, letting people kind of get used to seeing it because I think slowly but surely it's definitely changing. But I just think people need to realise that if you're going to start tweeting out stuff like that, it's just going to set us back even more because look, we're doing our best. We're doing what most male pundits are doing. You don't have to slate every little thing that we do, you know? Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, there is one more thing I want to ask you about as well. Uh, you played for Dundalk City in the past. Obviously, I'm based up here in Dundalk these days. Uh, and I was just reading about the history of that club and it, it was quite crazy what went on the way it split in two and two clubs competing against each other. And now, unfortunately, there's no team in Dundalk. I know when Peak Six did take over the club, they mentioned they'd like to get a women's team launched again, but it hasn't come to fruition at the moment. And we would love to see more women's clubs pop up across the country. And Dundalk seems like a place, a football mad town, where it might be absolutely ripe for one. So uh, tell us a little bit about that time up in Dundalk. Yeah, it was it was a strange one because I remember I'd been playing with Rohini at the time and I just wasn't enjoying my football. And, and my dad knew that. I was, I was, what, 16, 70 maybe at the time. And... He kind of had said to me, like, do you want to go somewhere else? I didn't really want to go somewhere else in Dublin because Rahini were probably one of the better teams in Dublin. So, like, the opportunity came because I played with a girl called Grace Murray, would have been good friends with her on the Irish team, and she played for Dundalk. And her dad, Colm, and my dad became really good friends through travelling to to wear matches and stuff. So it ended up coming up randomly. They said, why don't you come and play for Dundalk? And myself and my dad thought about it and my dad worked nights so he had to drive me obviously to train and matches and stuff and then be on the road to get back for work so it was it was a, a big commitment for him and obviously something that I I think most parents do for for a lot of kids around around Ireland to kind of bring them to matches but someone who I really depended on so it was a yeah it, it was a good time as well I think Dundalk always had a really good team they were always very big force in women's football they had some very good players like Sandra Lynch, uh, Eilish Nevin, Grace Murray, who I mentioned before, all play within the Irish setup. So, like, they had a very good team. And I actually got there after the split. So, I don't really know a lot about what happened. I know it was kind of a little bit bitter at the time. And um, a lot of things kind of were said and done. I think it was a, a silly thing. It happens in Irish football, unfortunately, mm-hmm. from time to time. But I think it would be a great a great thing to see see uh, a women's team in Dundalk, as you say, with how, how well the men's team have done over the last couple of years. It would be nice to see uh, a women's team in Dundalk again. Uh, and again, before I let you go, most people are probably wondering why I haven't asked you about the Puskas Award yet, because uh, <laughs> look, I'm sure you've done millions of interviews about that. So I really wanted to to get the rest of the stuff in first. But you actually popped up on the ESPN Twitter yesterday. Uh, yeah, was... did, did you arrive late to the awards? Yeah, I actually... <laughs> so I... I want to put it out there. I've never been late for football. I've never been late for training. I've never been late for a match. But when it comes to... Um, like family events or parties or if we're meeting for dinner or something like that, I'm usually the one who's late. And even if it's not me who's late, if it's Dean who's late, it'll be me who gets the blame because I'm the one who's always late. So it was just a bit of a funny story to tell because obviously that picture was taken because I needed to go to the bathroom before we were told we had to go into the, to our seats in the auditorium before the live show started. And I, of course, obviously left for the last minute. We've been in talking to Ronaldo, you know, as you do. So I was like, I'm going to go to the toilet and we'll go out then. And, and I went into the bathroom and was kind of taking my time. And I came out, like literally everybody was gone. And I was like, and Dean was standing there going, come on, we need to have gone in. Like the show's there and we have to get to our seat. So I obviously just bed off then on front of Dean looking to get to my seat. And that picture is literally, it looks like I'm snubbing the two lads, but there's literally a load of photographers to the left of me, wires all over the floor and we're late. So I'm like literally just trying to get by them as fast as I can to get to my seat. And obviously if you look in the background, you can see Dean and it's like he was late, but it was me, it was the one who was late. So yeah, I put up a post on my Instagram yesterday um, that people can never slag me for being late again because if I hadn't been late, I would have never got that photo. So... <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Uh, and look, what were the two lads like? You said you were talking to Ronaldo. I know Dean is a big Ronaldo fan as well. So I, I'd say that was a very surreal experience. Yeah, look, the whole thing was a bit surreal. Even just looking back at it now and thinking about it, because at the time it was, it was all, it all happened so fast. I know people say that all the time, but it really did. Like the whole day it was crazy. I was being pulled left, right and centre doing interviews for different things. And like my dad and my brother and Dean's sister Carla came to the awards and we had my agent at the time, Eamon, and a couple of other people kind of Irish media and stuff were over in there kind of little entourage so like I was being pulled to do different interviews and I'd come back from one interview and my dad and Eric my brother would be like Jesus we're just seeing Ruth Gullet and Thierry Henry getting out of the lift over there and we'd be sitting down having a cup of tea and looking around you just see all sorts of people like we sat down for lunch 
and uh, my brother would be a little bit old. My brother's 40 this year, so he'd be a little bit older than me. And we've seen Del Piero walking in, who would have been kind of his era player. Like, and obviously, I knew who Del Piero was as well now, but like, my brother was just like, Jesus, there's Del Piero. And I was like, Come on, we go and ask him for a photo. So the whole family went over and we got a photo with him. Like, it was just. It was just, as you say, a surreal experience because, like, and I wouldn't really, and either with Dean, as you probably know, be like a kind of a fangirl or a fanboy in terms of loving players. It was just to see so many talented footballers who you would have looked up to and watched over the years right in front of you was just, as you say, like a surreal kind of experience. Uh, he's not as polished at, at, at the interviews as yourself yet, but we'll get him there. <laughs> we'll get him there next season now we're in the Premier Division. Um, you were probably a little bit lucky that goal is recorded, though, because that wouldn't be the done thing back then. Yeah, definitely. I think um, and it was an away game as well, because in fairness to Eileen Gleeson, who was our manager at the time, she would have recorded a lot of our home games for t- uh, for team analysis, like we would have done. We would have been one of the first to do that. Like So uh, thankfully, John Flood, who was the manager in uh, Wexford at the time, was recording the game and he caught the goal on clip. And it was funny because after the game, one of the girls kind of said to me, oh, you're going to go viral. And I didn't even realise that the game had been recorded. Like So I was texting my brother and Dean and saying, I'm at the score in an absolute world. Do you want to see the goal I scored? Not knowing that they had recorded it. So it was nice to be able to to then see it on video. And and obviously the way it took off, we never ever expected that to happen. But uh, yeah, just to have it on video at all was, was nice to have. Definitely been great chatting to you today. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, look, no. stay safe out there. Thanks very much for having me, Kieran.